This morning we're going to talk about outshining the opposition. You know the situation. There's rumors and innuendo going around, false accusations, slander and deceit, the twisting and misrepresenting what was said so as to put words in your mouth that they knew were never ever there. They attempt to sow seeds of doubt in the minds and hearts of they know that you love and you care for. This is what happened when a friend becomes a foe, when an ally becomes an adversary. This is what takes place when the opposition puts a target on your back. And this is more than a sermon illustration. It's more than a scenario for most, if not all, of, of you that are gathered here this morning. I want you to know that you're not alone. Throughout God's Word, we learn about those who have suffered from slander and insults and accusations. Jeremiah had been sent by God to speak to God's people living in Judah just before the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem. J Jeremiah was on an assignment. And folks, he was faithful in carrying out every detail of the task that God had given him to do. And yet those who received the message from Jeremiah, they were livid, absolutely livid. They saw him as their adversary and not God's messenger. And in Jeremiah 38, verse 4, we read where some of the officials of Judah, they went to King Zedekiah and they said, this man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who were left in the city, as well as all of the people, by the things that he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. And yet, nothing could have been further from the truth. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he loved the people of Judah. He loved them with all of his heart, but because they did not like the message that God had given to him, they did everything in their power to try and destroy the man, just to get rid of him. King David had a friend, his closest counselor, a man named Ahithophel. Ahithophel, many believe, was the grandfather of Bathsheba. Ahithophel had been David's right-hand man for years, and David trusted all of the counsel that came from Ahithophel about anything David was going through in life. It's easy to understand why David had such trust in what Ahithophel had to say because we read in 2 Samuel 16, verse 23, every word Ahithophel spoke seemed as wise as if it had come directly from the mouth of God. Well, the most painful time in King David's life was when his son Absalom decided he was going to take the throne from his father, take the kingdom from his dad. David was crushed, absolutely destroyed, when he found out his longtime friend and counselor Ahithophel had allied himself with his son Absalom and they had plotted to kill him. David wrote in Psalm 41, 9, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. Those who are closest to us can inflict the greatest pain. Amen? Amen? There is nothing more devastating than to have a trusted friend turn and do everything in their power to try and destroy us. David wrote about that. He expressed those feelings in Psalm 55. Beginning in verse 12, David writes, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it's you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. It is a sad reality of life, but it is a, pervas a pervasive reality of life that relationships can turn on a dime. I mean, they can fall apart in an instant. But the question before us this morning is this. What do we do when we are made aware that there are cracks forming in our friendships? What can we do when our relationships begin to unravel? 
Well, our scripture this morning gives us such incredible insight about what Paul did in his relationship with the people of Corinth when that relationship went sideways. Let's read our scripture first and then we'll see what we can learn. Starting in verse 12. Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you with integrity and godly sincerity. You need to underline those two words in your Bible. Those are key words and we're going to come back to them. With integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. We do not write you anything that you cannot read or understand. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand us fully so that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Remember, Paul had spent 18 months developing relationships with the people of Corinth. He had started that church there. He had gone out and shared the gospel. He had led men and women and boys and girls to Christ. And then he had discipled them so they could grow in their relationship with the Lord. How in the world could these people now turn on him? Well, the truth of the matter is, the majority weren't turning against him. But there were those in the congregation who were willing to listen to the false teachers who had slipped into the pews and were doing everything in their power to try and discredit Paul, to try and undermine the very foundation that Paul had laid for the whole church. Paul had to change his travel plans. He wasn't going to be able to visit the church when he first said that he was going to visit them. And the false teachers jumped on that change of plans as an opportunity to attack Paul's integrity and character simply because he had a change of plans. We'll talk more about this next week. They said that Paul was mentally unbalanced. That he was wishy-washy. He was fickle. He was full of ulterior motives. And later in the study, we'll learn that the false teachers were telling the people in Corinth, remember, they were there, Paul was in Ephesus. So those who were right there, the false teachers that were trying to undermine Paul's ministry among the people, they were telling him, yeah, Paul likes to throw his weight around in his letters, but it, whenever you hear him speak live, he's a nobody. He amounts to nothing. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, we read where Paul writes, for some say, this is what's being said about him in the church, his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Isn't it interesting how a strength can be twisted by those who desire to bring you down? Paul was a strong leader. Let me tell you, you better be a strong leader if you're going to go into hostile cities and share the gospel. Paul was a strong leader, but the false teachers were taking that strength and twisting it and making Paul out to be some kind of tyrant. It's easy to examine Paul's life and ministry, to evaluate and examine how he dealt with the opposition in his day. But how do we deal with the sharp arrows of accusation when they come flying our way? I'll confess, in my own life, I have not dealt with opposition in a Christ-like way many times in the past. I have allowed opposition to distract me. I've allowed opposition to drive me into a pit of despair. Many years ago, there was a man who arrived here at Britain Christian Church and immediately he jumped in with both feet. I mean, he came to worship every Sunday morning. He attended a Bible study that I taught. And then during the week, he would drop by to discuss the Bible study with me. I mean, this guy is every preacher's dream. He actually did the lesson. <laughs> and then he wanted to talk about it. And, 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 and ask questions and throw in observations. I mean, it was every preacher's dream. And then one day he showed up at my office with an article from the Daily Oklahoman. The article had to be 30, 40 years old. He wanted me to read it. It was about a young guy barely in his 20s that had committed a crime in Oklahoma City. So I read the article and then I handed it back to him. He said, well, what do you think? 
I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you need to remove him from the church. You now know what he did. You should, he shouldn't be allowed to attend church here anymore. That man was now in his 60s. He was attending Britain Christian Church at the same time. He committed the crime when he was in his early 20s. Now he's in his 60s. I didn't know that story of his life, but I knew that he had lived this wild and crazy lifestyle and accepted Christ, and the Lord had changed his life. And so I said to the guy that gave me the article, he committed that crime when he was young. He's, he's accepted Christ, and the Lord has changed his life. If Jesus has forgiven him for his sin, how can I not forgive him? Hey, he didn't say amen. He was livid. I mean livid. He stormed out of my office after ranting and raving for a little while, and he began to pick up the phone and call people in the church and to make all kinds of accusations about things that I was doing. It was horrible. He called my house. And if Connie answered the phone, he would tell her things, horrible things that I was doing. If my young sons answered the phone, he would tell Dan and Nate all of these horrible things. Let me tell you, she is an angel. She talked me off of the ledge so many times because I told Connie, he doesn't realize I didn't grow up in the church. I grew up in locker rooms. I know where he lives. Three blocks from this church. And nothing would have pleased me more to go down there and just beat the fool out of him. And he's not this tall. He's not, I'm serious, he's not this tall. I'm 61 today and I could still take him. <laughs> but the power of Christ constrained me. And I mean that literally. So what I did... Instead of beating him to a pulp, I got on the phone and every time I would hear that he called somebody in the church, I called that person. Hey, I hear you got a phone call. I'm so sorry. I want you to know I didn't do anything he's accusing me of doing. And then one day I heard that he called Arlene Meyer. And I picked up the phone and I called my sweet friend. And it just killed me that he would say to her what I knew he was saying to everybody else. And I said, Arlene, I heard you got a phone call. I'm so sorry. I want you to know, Mike, stop. She said, Mike, those of us who know you, we know you. We don't need you to call us. And those people that don't know you, a phone call is not going to do you any good anyway. Why don't you go back to doing the work that God's given you to do and don't make any more phone calls? And it was as if God himself, I never made one more phone call. I didn't handle that in a Christ-like way. <laughs> Folks, when relationships turn sour and accusations are made against you that have no basis in truth, then we can really learn from what Paul did in his relationships with the people in Corinth. There's three things I want to highlight from, you know, uh, we're only looking at three verses, but the truth is we're not going to get past verse 12. <laughs> but boy, is it rich what I want to share with you. Paul opens the letter by saying this. Now, this is our boast. In the Christian Standard Bible, they translate that same Greek phrase. Now, this is our confidence. With all of the accusations being leveled at Paul, Paul's confidence before God was that he had acted with integrity and godly sincerity in all the relationships that he had with the people of Corinth. Paul's conscience was clear. It was clear. The Greek word that's translated conscience is the word sunidesis. It, it means conscience. It also can be translated a, a moral sensitivity. A moral sensitivity. I love what John MacArthur writes. Listen to this. The conscience is a warning system placed by God into the very framework of the human soul. Like physical pain, which warns of damage to the body, the conscience warns of damage to the soul. It reacts to the proximity of sin, warning the soul to pull up before it suffers the terrible consequences of sin. 
Our conscience is innate within every one of us. It's not if you give your life to Christ you get a conscience. You're born with a conscience. And yet, we should never ever place our conscience on the same level as the truth of God. They're different. But instead, we should understand our conscience as a wonderful gift which is innate within us to give us some sense of, of moral accountability in life. Paul wrote to the, this letter to the believers in Rome. He said he was comparing the Gentiles with the Jews. The Jews have the law. But Paul says, indeed, Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law. They are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written where? On their hearts. On their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness. And their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. Well, if you just read these verses in Paul's letter to Rome, you would think, well, you can totally trust your conscience. Sometimes it'll convict you. Sometimes it'll defend you. The law of God written upon the hearts of the Gentiles. And yet, you can't just take this verse. We've got to take the whole counsel of God. And in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, he wrote to them about food being sacrificed to idols. He said, hey, because Corinth was overrun with, idol, with temples to false gods. And in every one of those places, they sacrificed food to idols and then they had a meal. They ate the food. Paul said, hey, folks, an idol is nothing. It has no power. It has no significance. The food, therefore, sacrificed to idols, it's just food. But then he goes on to write this. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. So for the people, for many of the people of Corinth, the association of idols with food, it was so ingrained in many of the new believers in Corinth, even though they had come to know Jesus, they simply could not bring themselves to eat food that they knew had been sacrificed to idols. Paul says their conscience is weak. Because the fact that they feel strongly doesn't change the fact that an idol is nothing and the food is still just food. But they can't bring themselves to do that. So we can see that our conscience is not always in line with God's truth. And you and I as followers of Jesus, we must always go with God's truth. But let me say this for unbelievers. The conscience is a good place to start, right? Can you imagine not having a conscience? There are some people that don't. They commit the most heinous acts. It's a blessing God has given us a conscience. I can remember when I was young, when I was not attending church, growing up in my mom and dad's house, except Christmas and Easter, you know the story, never ever reading the Bible, never reading the Bible in my teenage years, and yet my conscience was, would convict me over and over and over again. I didn't know what to call it. I called it that little man in my head. And he would bug the snot out of me. And I tried everything in my power to get him to shut up and leave me alone, and he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And then I became a follower of Jesus. And I learned, hmm, this is a gift from God. And now I've got the Bible to check my conscience. When my conscience convicts me, go to the Word of God. Should I be convicted about that? When my conscience says, eh, don't worry about it, everybody does it, go to the Word of God. Check your conscience with the Word of God. We can have a clear conscience, but we should never forget that our conscience is not our final authority. Paul wrote in his first letter to the church in Corinth, he says, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. The second thing I want to highlight for us, well, just to finish that off, when we have relationships that begin to unravel, they begin to go sideways, we should check our conscience. 
Ask God to search our heart, to search our mind, to show us, is there anything that I've done that's contributed to this? Anything that I've said, anything that I've done that's been offensive, that I've alienated, that I've hurt somebody? And if so, then take the step to go and ask for forgiveness. And don't bring that weak game of, hey, listen, Melissa, if I did anything to upset you, I'm sorry. Name that thing. Secondly, the second thing I want to highlight for us this morning, Paul's conscience was clear because of the way that he conducted himself while he was with the people of Corinth. Paul conducted himself with integrity and godly sincerity. And understanding those two words is incredibly important for you and me living in Oklahoma City in 2022 because we are... To our conduct with those around us should be rooted and sustained by integrity and by godly sincerity. The Greek word translated integrity is the word haplotis. Paul uses it five times in 2 Corinthians and he uses it three times in his other letters. The word can mean simplicity or frankness, sincerity, uprightness, even generosity. David Garland writes, integrity prompts one to act on what is right, even if it is risky, unpopular, or unpleasant, and to do so steadfastly when the hail of criticism falls. I was taking a look at integrity from different perspectives this past week when I came upon a business website about the importance of integrity in the workplace for business owners. Listen to this. The author Susan Heathfield writes, Integrity is the quality of having ethical principles that are followed at all times. Honesty and trust are central to integrity, as is consistency. A person with integrity demonstrates sound, moral, and ethical principles and does the right thing no matter who's watching. Integrity is the foundation on which co-workers build relationships and trust. And it is one of the fundamental values that employers seek in the employees that they hire. Any business owner here, any supervisor that's with us this morning, they will tell you how vital integrity is for the health of their company. But let me tell you that integrity is even more vital for the health of our church. I mean, listen to this. Every church has problems. Every, I, I cannot even visit there and say, hey, pastor, y'all got problems. How do you know that, Mike? Are you clairvoyant? You have a crystal ball, a hotline to God? No. Your church is made up of people. And people have different opinions and different takes, vantage points on this or that. And so differences are going to arise. It's inevitable. It's going to happen over and over again. The question is this. The way we engage with one another, the way we treat one another when differences arise will either demonstrate the integrity we possess or the integrity we lack. Amen. And let me tell you, out there, hey, it's a free-for-all. I mean, any business owner, I feel for you today. Because we've, we've, we've strayed from biblical truth. And so everybody's going about it just as good as they can with what they got to work with. But in the church, there should be no tolerance for a lack of integrity in our relationships with one another. And through the years, and when you've been here as many years as I've been here, you've seen brothers and sisters treat one another, another brother or sister, in ungodly ways that totally lack integrity. And it should not be tolerated. Amen. It just should not. You are my brother, my sister in Christ. If we can't sit down when we have differences of opinion, when we don't see things through the same set of eyes and trust God to bring together what we've broken, then something is fundamentally wrong with your walk or mine or both. Amen. Or both. Paul not only related to the people of Corinth with integrity, but he also exhibited godly sincerity. This is such a beautiful word. It's a picturesque word. It's a compound word in Greek. The first word uh, is for sunlight. 
And the second part of this compound word is to judge. The word for to judge. It, the, it was used in Greco-Roman literature to, to describe things that were pure, like gold with no dross or no alloys. But my favorite illustration is how it was used in the marketplace. Potters, everything was pottery back in those days, right? The vast majority. And so when you would go to the market and you wanted to buy a new pot, a new dish, a new cup, well, those potters, sometimes there would be cracks in their pottery. But they were very savvy business people, so what they would do is they would melt wax to fill the cracks, and that way you couldn't tell the difference. But there were some buyers in the marketplace who were even more savvy than the potters. And so when they would go to shop, they would hold it up to the sunlight, and the sunlight would show if there was a crack. It would shine right through the wax. You know what it really is? It's transparency. Hey, I have nothing to hide. This is the way I deal with you in public. This is the way I would deal with you in private. When you're watching, this is who I am. When you're not watching, I'm still the same guy. That's what Paul is saying. We dealt with you with integrity and transparency with a godly sincerity. Paul uses the same word a little bit later in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. The false teachers, they were constantly trying to work an angle. Constantly trying to work an angle. They were tearing Paul down so they could build themselves up. And Paul said, I'm not going to follow your lead. I'm not going down that path. Let me tell you, in our relationships with others, we need to exhibit godly sincerity. Not trying to use people for our advantage, but praying that God would use us for the advantage of others. Do you see the difference? Boy, this is a rare mindset today, even in the church. I remember many years ago when a politician began attending worship here. Um, after he had been here two or three weeks, somebody in our church recognized him and found me after church and said, Hey, Mike, did you see so-and-so? I said, Yeah, I did. What do you think? I said, I think he won't be back after the election's over. He was running to be a representative of this district. He's just here to get votes. He's not here to serve. Mike. I said, watch and see. When the election was over, guess what? I'm still waiting for the rascal to come back, and it's been like 20 years. You and I, we are here to serve, not be served. We are to follow in the footsteps of the one who disadvantaged himself in order to put you at the advantage. That's how we are to live. Will it cost you? Absolutely. Do it anyway. Amen. Be a blessing. We are to follow in Jesus' steps. And you know what? That may, that may seem somewhat reasonable in dealing with people that we love, people that we care about. But when I say this is also how we are to deal with those who oppose us, those who seek to slander us, then that's where you go, i got to draw the line. And yet, do you remember Jesus' words? You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. People have chosen different paths in dealing with those who have opposed them, those who have slandered their name, who spread false rumors and wanted to discredit them in the community. People have chosen all kinds of ways to come about, about that. The predominant approach is to fight fire with fire. Roll up your sleeves and get down in the dirt. They're going to sling mud, then you sling more, right? Those who follow Jesus might want to, cho want, might want to choose that path, but we died to self. We can't live for us any longer. And so we must follow in Jesus' steps. Paul writes in verse 12, he is not relying on worldly wisdom, but on the grace of God. 
And that's the last thing I want to point out to you, is look at the way the grace of God is at work in Paul's life. He's being confronted at every turn. He's being opposed. People are saying all kinds of things, and yet he is a man on mission, and he is working by the grace of God. Paul says he conducted his business, he lived his life with integrity and godly sincerity while relying on God's grace. In everything Paul did, he understood his work as God's work being enacted and empowered through him. Take a look at Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Paul says, he's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in me. Paul hit the streets. He got up early. He stayed up late. He went to places where nobody else would go, and he made sure to go to the places where everybody hung out and gathered. And he did all of that for the purpose of sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with all people. And he did it with the energy that Christ so powerfully worked in him. Folks, we so desperately need that mindset. Each day we leave the house, we need to recognize I am an ambassador of Christ. Lord, you are sending me forth today to do your work. Let me tell you, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. I am therefore Christ ambassador, as though God were making his appeal through me. That's true of every one of us. Now, can you imagine an ambassador to the president of the United States, wherever they are in the world? Man, they watch their P's and Q's. They don't pop off. They can only say things that align with what the White House is saying. They can only do things that align with what the White House is doing. And that's a puny man-made government. You, you and I are ambassadors of Christ, the King of glory. Let me tell you, when we leave in the morning, if we would fill our mind with that, it would radically change the way that we engage with all people, friend and foe alike. But you say, Mike, they keep coming at me. They keep saying things about me. They keep twisting my words. Mm -hmm. And they did his as well. Outshine the opposition. Let his light shine. Because you know what? In situations like that, nobody, and I mean nobody, in relationship where that kind of stuff is going on, nobody will love them with Jesus' love. Everybody will fight them with fire. But you fight fire with fire and all it does is burn the house down. Take up your cross and let his light shine. Man, what a calling. Man, what a savior. Let me tell you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is why I always give an invitation at the end of the service. Because whatever I talk about for 10 or 15 minutes during the sermon, you don't have it in you to live it out there. Not in and of yourself. It is not, I, I mean, I told you, I, I was walking with Jesus and wanted to go pound this guy living down the street. So I sure don't have it in me apart from Christ to love like Jesus loves. So if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to come forward. Give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart and start a great and glorious journey of growing in your walk with him. As we stand and sing the song of invitation, won't you come?